from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director, and today we're going to be talking about Lebanon. Against the backdrop of a massive economic and financial crisis and a now three-month-old nationwide protest movement, Lebanon swore in a new government on Tuesday, a technocratic cabinet that is widely seen as a shadow government for Hezbollah and other entrenched political leaders. To discuss where things stand and where they might be headed, we've got an all-star cast of Lebanon experts on the podcast today, including Paul Salem, Randa Slim, and Bilal Saab. Paul is the president of MEI. Randa is a senior fellow and the director of MEI's Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogues program. Bilal is a senior fellow and the director of MEI's Defense and Security program. Paul, Randa, Bilal, thank you for joining us and welcome back to the podcast today. Good to be with you. Thank you, Alistair. Thanks for having us. Well, Lebanon's been without a government since the end of October, but on Tuesday, a new 20-member cabinet was was announced under newly appointed Prime Minister Hassan Diab. What do we know about the new government so far? Well, we know a lot about it. It's been three months since uh, protests erupted in Lebanon, led to the resignation of the government led by Saad Hariri and attempts to form this new government. It's a government of 20 individuals. Uh, uh, they are indeed technocrats in the sense of not being professional politicians, any of them. That was one of the demands of the protesters, but the protesters were very clear that they wanted independent technocrats. These technocrats and this government was formed by uh, one uh, faction or one coalition in, in the Lebanese oligarchy, which is the coalition allied and led by Hezbollah. So it's a very pro-Iran and pro-Assad, pro-Syrian government. There's no representation politically for what used to be other groups like March 14 and so on. Each uh, of these, uh, like Hezbollah as a party, the Free Patriotic Movement led by the president's uh, son-in-law, the Amal Movement, each have very specific representatives. Uh, so effectively, it is a shadow government in the sense that the big decisions are taken by five or six men. Uh, all allied with with Hezbollah and, and Assad in different ways, and uh, it will you know have a very very difficult time appealing either to the Western uh, uh, countries or to uh, Arab Gulf countries at a time when economic uh, emergency aid is greatly needed. Uh, then the street has already largely rejected it. Rund, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts here as well. Looking at the makeup of the new government, what what jumps out at you? Well, six women. It's a first for Lebanon. Uh, some people might quibble with the qualification of some. I would quibble also with the qualification of some of the men on the cabinet. But uh, it's a precedent that I, th I hope is going to be, you know, repeated in the future. And I hope that these six women now who are in the cabinet, who are in the decision making, do something about the nationality law in Lebanon. Uh, these women, if they were married to non-Lebanese, they, even as ministers, according to the Lebanese constitution, they cannot pass citizenship to their children. So I'm hoping that these women can do something about that, given their position. Now, I, 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 I agree with uh, Paul. I think it's a one-color cabinet, if we can put it this way. We have seen the reaction from the street already in since the announcement of the cabinet. Uh, right immediately after, as well as yesterday evening, uh, we have had clashes in downtown. Uh, they have become even more violent than before. Uh, and uh, that's a worrying trend as uh, these protests start moving more and more into violence. And uh, and, and that it can hurt uh, the protest cause in bringing the rest of the Lebanese um, to join them uh, in their in their uh, in their activities. Uh, most of the Lebanese, of course, are sympathetic to the demands that are formulated by the protesters. But I think also a lot of these Lebanese who are sitting on the fence, have not joined the protest actively. They look at the scenes on their TV screens from downtown Beirut, violence and all of this, and they, they become reluctant, you know. And However, I think there is also a tendency right now, despite the protesters' reaction to the, um, to the government, the rest of the Lebanese, in my opinion, they, they are willing to give the government a chance. They want to test it for a while uh, and see what comes out of it. Uh, I don't think personally much eventually, but I think today the mood, at least in a great many segments of the Lebanese society, is to wait it out and give them some time to prove themselves. 
Bilal, I want to get your thoughts on the issue specifically that Ramda just touched on of the escalating violence. I know over the weekend we saw nearly 500 protesters injured and uh, an escalation in the force used by security forces. How concerned are you about that and and the kind of prospects for greater violence moving forward? Well, I think everybody is concerned. Uh, but just generally speaking on most domestic issues, I'm just going to defer to Paul and Randa because they're far more knowledgeable and experienced than I am. But um, not to dodge your question, there is no national consensus about this um, government. Uh, we're waiting for also a vote of confidence in parliament. Uh, therefore, whatever anger you're going to see in the streets will continue, I think. And the protesters have not really minced words about their disappointment with the um, creation of the government. So, of course, there's always a chance that things will spiral out of control in the streets. Uh, there's always a capacity issue on the part of the uh uh, security forces to contain things. So yes, of course, it is a concern moving forward. Historically, Hezbollah has tried to avoid the kind of messy business of actually governing, uh, but they seem to have switched gears here now, taking a, the, a different approach of kind of directly backing the, the one color government. Ronda, what's changed and, and uh, what are they trying to achieve here? I think they were faced with the fait accompli, you know, uh, when Hariri resigned, they were betting that Hariri will change his mind and then they can convince him to come back as prime minister. However, Hariri has certain conditions uh, that he wanted to be fulfilled prior to agreeing to return as prime minister. And one of the primary conditions he wanted is that Gibran Basil, who is the son-in-law of the president, former foreign minister, a lie of Hezbollah, uh, is not to be in the government. And eventually, I mean, this government does not have Gibran Basile in it. But yet, when Hariri put forth that condition, that was not acceptable to Basile. And uh, Hezbollah policy has always been to stick by their allies. And they consider uh, Aoun uh, Basile as, uh, you know, important allies to them inside Lebanon. And so they were faced with a fait accompli, basically to form this government because they were afraid of institutional vacuum, total state failure. That's one. Uh, two, in my opinion, they also wanted to teach Hariri a Lesson, you know, uh, you you opted out, you know, OK, we are going to take it up and we are going to move forward uh, without you. I think this is now the the this was what what drove them into that decision. I think now they are also in the mindset they are going to do their best to help this government stay in power. However, I think one thing that um, that ha they have been suffering from is the lack of knowledge or the poor knowledge about how deep of a hole the economy is in. And they still believe, and I think many other Lebanese parties, maybe they still believe there's some magic tricks that can be employed somehow to dig Lebanon out of this hole. But Hezbollah has been notoriously known for a, not having a deep bench in terms of economic expertise. And so that also explains that attitude. But I think for now, uh, they already issued a statement saying they are calling on the Lebanese people to give this government a chance and wait, see what they deliver. I think Randa has answered uh, a big chunk of a major question, which is why Hezbollah did it, right? So I just wrote about it uh, on the website of MEI. You know, what is the main driver? Recognizing that the challenge, as Randa and Paul have said, economically is just enormous. Why would you want to take on such a hot potato, right? And political division, angry streets. And we don't have an answer to that, that uh, we're all very comfortable with. Um, I think that one of the uh, scenarios that could be probable is that Hezbollah is basically fed up with trying to come up with some kind of a compromise with its old friends, whether it's that Hadid and others, recognizing also that there is confrontation between its main ally, Iran, and the United States, therefore taking charge in their own hands in Lebanon, uh, full control of politics, right? Uh, therefore, a government that is very responsive to their preferences, but it could be something else also that's a little bit more accommodationist in the sense that this is maybe a government that is sort of, as some people call it in Lebanon, a transition government. So let's just test the waters. Its main purpose will be to prevent further deterioration of the economic uh, situation, keep things afloat until there's a little bit more clarity about what kind of assistance the government will get from the international community, specifically Washington how things evolve between Washington and Tehran, all of those things are still quite pending. And whether we like it or not, the reality is that all of these things do have an impact on what happens in Beirut. So 
Could it be a completely confrontational government where a decision is firm to pursue that path? Or could it be more of a transition? We just don't know. But I think the next few days are going to pretty much be quite instrumental. Paul, I know one of the other scenarios that you'd laid out is uh, is the potential for this to be a kind of government that takes the necessary uh, unpopular decisions to, to deal with the economy, kind of takes the heat for that and then kind of disappears perhaps down the road once that's out of the way. Maybe could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, it, it's possible. I mean, keeping in mind that Hezbollah's first choice was to form a government with Saad Hariri under certain conditions and that didn't work out. So this does seem to be a plan B, which might indicate that it is short-lived uh, because it's it doesn't and will not get major Sunni support in Lebanon. And that is a long-term problem for sure. So it could be transitional or temporary. In that sense, there are two or three things uh, that the this oligarchy and Hezbollah could find useful. One is that this government could take uh, some of the unpopular economic and painful decisions that need to be taken. Uh, secondly, that it uh, makes some quick changes in security positions in the country, which is particularly after the Qasem Soleimani killing, uh, probably the driving factor in Hezbollah's A, decision to move quickly to form any government, uh, but B, to try to reshuffle reshuffle the security positions uh, in the Lebanese security apparatus to lock them down more effectively in the on- ongoing and oncoming you know, confrontation with the U.S. The third thing is that uh, forming a government of technocrats at a time when there's really no way they can succeed, quote unquote, in the economy, no matter, even if they were the best, it's going to get really bad, uh, is a useful mechanism for the oligarchs to say, you wanted technocrats, you got technocrats, look where we are now, why don't you come back, come to Papa, as it were, come back to the people you you know. Uh, So it's a way of burning the idea that technocrats can be saviors as a third function. Coming back to the uh, security issue, it's already very significant and something to watch that the, uh, the there's a new Minister of Interior. Now, this is to be tested, of course, but the former Minister of Interior, uh, Rayyal Hassan, uh, uh, who was a technocrat herself, uh, former Minister of Finance, certainly uh, totally opposed to use of force against protesters in general. And she was part of the Saad Hariri Future Movement, which at least during this period is trying to present itself as on the side of the protesters. So they kept as much as they could. Now, the internal security forces, some of them answered directly to the Speaker of Parliament, and they were very harsh. And there's infiltrations here and there, but they were trying to keep the internal security forces, uh, you know, somewhat neutral. Uh, I think that's gone. I think uh, the internal security forces... And I don't want to get. I don't want to give the new minister benefit of the doubt. Uh, he's a, a general Fahmi. He's a milit, you know, interior interior security officer. Uh, but I expect the internal security forces now to play a much clearer repressive role, and we might be seeing that already. Uh, the other important security apparatus is the bigger one, which is the the Lebanese army. Uh, that is not affected by the government position. The minister of defense does not have any command influence over the Lebanese Armed Forces, it's the general of the army, General Joseph Aoun, who himself, for political reasons, I would say, has tried to stay more or less aligned neutrally or appearing to be in favor of the protests as part of his and the army's positioning. That will remain as long as he remains head of the army. It's conceivable that they might try to change him, but he's so popular that I don't think they would dare. But there are other positions in the army commands and army intelligence that they can affect. So that's something uh, to watch very closely. Um, uh, I do want to, since we've mentioned, you know, particular ministries, I think it's very interesting that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, is Ambassador Nassif Hetti, uh, someone known to all of us, uh, a very excellent fellow, I must say, was an Arab League diplomat for a long time, served in Europe as well as Arab capitals. And uh, I think his selection might indicate two maybe tactical you know, moves by this Hezbollah-leaning and Assad-leaning government. One is that they are aware that I think President Macron and that France really wants to, you know, I know they're not terribly happy with the new government, but they feel so close and so involved. They and many Europeans concerned about refugees and state failure, they want to 
find a way to engage, I think, more than the Americans. And having somebody like Nassif Hitti, who's very credible in Paris, very credible in Europe, would be an interesting signal from this new government that it's not hopeful about Washington, but it's hopeful about France and Europe. The second important signal, he is an Arab, former Arab League ambassador. And it's no secret that uh, a number of members of the Arab League, led by Egypt and Jordan, want to move towards normalizing relations with the Assad regime. And the Assad regime has a number of ministers in the new government. And it's possible that they favored uh, an Arab League, uh, you know, former ambassador to liaise with Cairo and Amman, Jordan, and hopefully some of the Gulf capitals, partly as a bridge maybe uh, to, you know, uh, deal, dealing with Syria somewhat, but also as a bridge to dealing with this new Lebanese government, which has Assad influence in it. Well, I'm, quite, I'm curious to get your, your thoughts on the international response to the new cabinet that we've seen so far from, from Washington, from France, from the Gulf. Well, Paul addressed the French uh, dimension. Um, I think the most important player, no doubt, is Washington, especially if there's any chance of coming up with a major IMF program. Obviously, the one country that has key influence and a voice in that institution is Washington. I'm going to read you what Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said about Lebanon, because I think it's a really interesting statement. He was just asked recently, what is Washington's reaction to uh, the government, whether they should expect any kind of assistance? And he said, I don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, we're prepared to engage, provide support, but only to a government that's committed to reform. You know, not too long ago, if I recall, uh, Washington's singular focus was literally counting how many ministers Hezbollah had in the government, right? That was a major concern of the administration. A lot of that obviously is tied to the maximum pressure campaign against Iran, rightly or wrongly. And now all of a sudden, the emphasis is on uh, reforms. Now, there is a relationship between the two, obviously. I don't think as well as really has a track record of significant reforms. They're not interested in politics anyway. But, you know, if the new government comes up with some kind of an agenda that seems a little bit more credible and <clears throat> they can at least start instituting some, you know, short term moves that might instill some confidence in the minds of U.S. officials, then maybe that U.S. position is less rigid than we thought it was. We don't know the answer to that. But I think the administration right now is sort of like, a, I think Randa has mentioned in, in her uh, comments or in her writing that it's sort of a wait and see situation. And it's interesting, as right? you say, I mean, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State said, I don't know yet. Right. <laughs> well, it's very and interesting. That's, that's, and that's following an earlier statement, right, which yep. was said by him, in yep. which he emphasized exactly this issue of reforms. And because in the past, what, that, what, what came out of state, they said, inclusivity, you know, they emphasize the word inclusive. That word has disappeared from that statement, you mm. know. That word has mm. disappeared from this reply, mm -hmm. you know. It's about reforms and it's not about inclusivity because whenever it, inclusivity was used, it was a code word for not a one-color cabinet. Mm -hmm. And now that they are faced with a one-color cabinet, now the criterion for U.S. support is going to be reforms and not necessarily inclusivity. Yeah, but expect that interagency discussion to come back about Lebanon. Yes. I mean, the Pentagon has not changed its position about Lebanon, given its strong support for the LAF. They're going to be laser focused on any possibility of once again withdrawing, suspending any kind of aid to the, to the army. State is, we just discussed it, a little bit unclear. A lot of it pending really what's going to happen yes. with the Iranians, obviously. I mean, this is how they see Lebanon, through that prism. And when there's a little bit more clarity about intentions towards Tehran in the aftermath of the Soleimani attack, then they'll probably determine what they're going to do with Lebanon. So that's why I go back to my earlier comment, like, might this be a government just in transition, awaiting a parliamentary elections in Lebanon, which will happen sometime in the next few months? 2022. Okay, Three not too <laughs> soon, but I guess... They, <laughs> Don't um, hold your breath. Right. Or American presidential elections. But things are so hot right now that these schedules are just so far removed from now that I'm not sure that that kind of government can really survive these two major milestones. But also I think there is, and Paul referred to that, uh, I mean, if Lebanon totally collapses, you are going to talk, the international community, okay, partly is interested in 
avoiding another state collapse in the Middle East with all its repercussion. But also you have more than one million Syrian refugees. Uh, you know, as somebody said, it's not only Syrian refugees that are going to be starting to think about heading to Europe. It's Lebanese that are going to start heading to Europe as well. Mm. And so I think I think that's also an important concern for the international community, especially for European, you know, our European allies, but also for the US because of our European allies, that they, they need to work with Lebanon to prevent that kind of collapse that will push more people to European shores, whether Syrian, as has happened with the Syrian crisis, or now Lebanese because of the Lebanese economic collapse. And just a final point, Alistair, on U.S. policy. Uh, other than waiting to see if there's going to be a credible reform agenda, I mean, the two major equities of Washington uh, in Lebanon, which sort of have represented the pillars of its policy, are the central bank and the Lebanese army. If the new cabinet starts undermining those two major institutions, then obviously that would affect how they treat the new government. And building on that, I think there is definitely a push within certain quarters of the Aoun Hezbollah, mostly Aoun Hezbollah axis, of pushing out, of using this as an opportunity to push out Riyad Salami, the governor of the central bank. But however, there is a counter argument, even within that camp that's being offered or that being discussed, saying, well, he he is part of the problem. He brought this mess to us. And in fact, giving him a way out now is too easy. We should have him stay there and try to fix this and pay the consequences of the mess that has been brought in. So even within this access, which many analysts said, oh, they want to push Riyad Salami out. I think there is an ongoing debate uh, about whether we want him out or whether we want to keep him in. We're running a bit short on time, but uh, before we wrap up, I'd love to give all of your kind of final thoughts on where you see things going from here and uh, maybe how long you expect the new government to last. Yeah, I want to sort of put this in broader context. Uh, This new government does not represent any fundamental change in the dynamics of the country. There is a ruling oligarchy. It is of two wings. One is more pro-Iranian, pro-Syrian, and one is less. (laughs) Uh, but they are the same oligarchy in the fun terms of the fundamental problems of corruption and mismanagement uh, and getting the country to where it is today. And that oligarchy is not going anywhere. The formation of this government or future governments is a kind of a shadow play. Uh, you know, uh, yes, one government might institute some little reform here, a little reform there. And this oligarchy is un- incapable of fundamental reform because they are part of the rot and the corruption in all the various sectors. It's just not going to happen. When you look at it long term, this phenomena of forming governments uh, is not very significant in the current situation. Uh, Secondly, the economy is going over a cliff. Now is the cliff 60 feet high or 50 feet high uh, or 40 feet high and, you know, if there's more effort, it's still a cliff and the consequences are going to be devastating. And as mentioned, there's a Syrian refugee issue. There's Lebanese, mainly Lebanese brain drain, uh, which is already happening, which is not dangerous for Europe and so on, as long as it's a, you know, middle class brain drain, but devastating for Lebanon and Lebanon's future. And the consequences of the economic collapse in terms of chaos and security are, are currently unpredictable, particularly the, that the economic collapse will include a collapse of the Lebanese pound and Lebanese currency. And the main institution that will feel the hit will be the Lebanese army, that their salaries will be worth very little uh, if this continues. And then how can an army which is not being paid effectively be effective? That's a very significant thing to worry about in the sense that we will have more phenomena of a failing state in a real sense and maybe loss of control in different areas. Uh, the revolution, the protesters, whatever you want to call them, are you know going through different uh, moments and so on. But to my mind, because the whole economic system is cratering profoundly, uh, it, it's turning not so much into a protest movement as a, you know, a necessary change, a revolution that it's no longer working and people will be hungry and desperate and families can't feed their kids. So whatever that revolution or protest is, is going to get stronger, maybe fiercer, 
uncertain is it going to get unified or not, but that ball is going to get bigger because poverty is going to spread in a major way. You know, when you pull back, the important date is sadly far away, and it's 2022, and that's when the parliamentary elections and the presidential elections, uh, that's when the date is. And it's, uh, you know, would behoove the protest movement and so on to begin organizing, centralizing, A, to impose its will in the formation of the next government. It failed to impose its will at all in this government. There's no reflection of the protest, and that's a, that's a problem. They should have had at least five ministers, seven ministers in the government. Uh, so they need to, I think, rethink uh, that strategy uh, and the strategy of preparing both for local and parliamentary elections in 2022 is the thing that might change the country. Uh, and might begin changing some of the oligarchy. That's a perfect segue. I want to say a final word about the protesters. Uh, and I think Paul hit the nail on the head. So certainly they haven't been able to overhaul the system. Current cabinet is not the dream team for them. Okay. A lot of uh, what they have called for hasn't happened. Uh, by all objective standards, this has been a failure of the protest movement. There's a lot of fatigue there's a lot of depression. There's a lot of concern over the security issues that you raised uh, initially, Alistair. Uh, but still, you know, a good bit who are committed to uh, protesting and to trying to make some kind of change in politics. None of that means that the role has been irrelevant or that their impact has been marginal. I think there's now a new variable in Lebanese politics, which is what we call the street. And the street is going to play the role of, lack of a better word, audit. Basically, everything that the cabinet is doing, you're going to see the reaction of the Lebanese through now the street for all the world to see. And that kind of reaction is going to be quite important for foreign powers, international institutions to look at before they commit any kind of major economic program, whether it's the IMF or otherwise, uh, to the country. So they still have a role to play. They just need to translate it a little bit more effectively into, at the end of the day, positions in the cabinet, right? I'll stop there. So I think, well, I mean, Hezbollah has been the tempo setter of Lebanese politics for some time. This government proves that it's definitely, and in fact, if it even more so, I think the checks and balances that having people like Hariri and his camp inside the cabinet in the past, along with, with uh, Hezbollah and company, they were able to provide some kind of checks and balances on some of Hezbollah's behavior. Those are gone. So we have to think about a new normal going forward, whether it is in the internal security. Although I, ha I, I disagree partly from uh, with Paul in that, that I don't think they need more in the army than what they have, you know, uh, in terms of presence and in terms of officers. I think they have enough in terms of positions. Uh, they are key positions that they care, focus, that they have their people or people they trust in. And I don't think they're going to go for more than that. Uh, they're going to stick with what they have. Uh, but also what's totally shocking to me is that after more than, what, 90 days now, I thought that at least the way they act in forming this government will reflect some kind of sensitivity to the protest, like awareness that there is a street that's saying no to them. And this way this cabinet has been formed, the horse trading that happened behind the scenes, uh, showing total indifference to the people's demand, to the people's, uh, you know, dreams, desire, uh, show that uh, this, you know, this oligarchy that Paul talks about is really living in a bubble in a total denial on one hand and on the other hand does not feel that the protest is any kind of threat to them that at least in the short to medium term and so we are going to be stuck in the stalemate of a government whether this one or whoever replaces it that's not going to be able to be seen that's not going to be legitimate not going to be able to deliver to people demand and a street that unless it works on the long term gets organized that's not able to offer an alternative to the great majority of Lebanese who are sitting on the fence and have, have not joined the protest movement yet. So we are in a period of protracted stalemate. Part of it might become violent, as Paul said, and 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 who knows, you know, what are the the the, the consequences uh, once violence, if it gets out of control, if it remains, uh, you know, under control. But we definitely are heading toward more repressive time, tougher economic times, and growing gap between the street, the people and the government. 
On that sobering note, we'll have to leave things there for now. But uh, Paul, Ronda, Bilal, thank you for joining us today. And we hope to have you back on the podcast soon. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alistair. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.